you all should know that um, in the month of July, my wife and I engage in the most appropriate behavior that can make them do that. We put our children on an airplane and we send them to their grandparents. And while my children are in Maryland with my parents staying up far later than they should, having donuts and ice cream for dinner, watching everything that Netflix has to offer. And I spend every day praying to God, who are these grandparents that you have created? Because I, I don't recognize them when they were my parents. And while my kids were up there being spoiled on yesterday, my wife and I decided to have a relaxing evening at home. We were going to binge watch a show that we love to watch on Netflix. She cooked an amazing meal, and we sat down to eat and watch Netflix. And you know if you've ever binge watched Netflix that you are completely dead to the outside world. One episode ends, and that countdown timer comes quick, doesn't it? Five, four, three, two, one, next episode finish the second episode, five, four, three, two, one, third episode, and you're just going episode after episode. I wanted to give both my wife and Netflix the due attention that they deserve. So I put my phone on silent and was upside down on the table. It was between one of those five second interludes between the show that I was glancing at my phone to look something up when I had over 30 texts. And I was reading the text messages, and I couldn't figure out what was going on except for the fact that something was happening with former President Trump. I then put into one of the group text messages, and I said, hey, I have not been watching the news. What's going on? And that's when one of my friends wrote, President Trump has been assassinated. So of course, we turned off Netflix and we get over it. This is why you can't have uneducated friends, because they don't know the difference. He didn't understand what assassinated meant. Bless his heart. He left the word attempt out of the phrase. Get over to CNN and we start watching what is going on. And all I could do was sit there and watch horror. We live in a country where for far too long the leaders of this country thought they could control the citizens by violence. We as a people are the victims of a country that is built on the stained blood of our ancestors because people thought they could make political, governmental, and ideological decisions Let's not have a free democratic process. Let's, let's not believe in the ideals that our Constitution and our Bill of Rights were written upon. Let's, let's have violence. Let's murder people and beat people and bring fear into the lives and hearts of people. And this is how we will control them. And I can only assume that on yesterday, whomever this human being was that decided to take an assassination attempt at the former president was engaging in that same behavior. Providence and all of our guests who are online and in person, it does not matter to me as your pastor what your political affiliation is. I concern myself not with if you are voting Democrat or if you are voting Republican or if you are voting independent. What I am concerned about is that you should someone is almost dead. You should never, I pray, have a joy in your heart when someone from this country decides to use violence to impact a governmental or political outcome. The bottom line is, Providence, we are better than that. The God we serve is better than that. And what 
we don't want to have happen is return to a day where the only way we know to deal with our differences is violence. The reason is because that same violence that they perpetrated against us, you and I brought into our homes, you and I brought to the treatment of our children, you and I brought to the treatment of our spouses and our significant others, we have taken on that evil that has been passed down to us. We as a community laugh and joke about the ways in which we discipline our kids over and against the way other cultures discipline their kids. Has it ever dawned on you that you in your DNA, it is so easy for you to beat your children because it was so easy for master to beat us? That's where we learn that from, brothers and sisters. If you don't think I'm correct, talk to people of other cultures. Leave the United States of America and go around the world and find out if they enact such violence against their children. You find the answer is no. We not only do it, we glorify it because it is in our DNA from the 1800s that when Master wanted to control us, he beat us. We watched Master do it to us, so we turned around and did it to our children. Violence is not the answer. I am horrifically sad that a human being thought that to have this particular election that is coming up in November have what this person thought was the correct outcome. That this person needed a weapon, needed to shoot at someone, and needed to murder an innocent person. I am horrifically sad that there's a family who woke up this morning that is not excited to go to church because they are grieving the loss of an innocent person who simply went to a rally and lost their lives. The best way that you and I can respond to this is to denounce violence of any kind in our lives, whether it be physical, emotional, or verbal. The second best way that you and I can respond to this is to recognize that we live in a country that supposedly has an appropriate democratic process. And so you and I should make it our personal business to say that we do not need violence to create a particular outcome of an election. And so to create that particular outcome, rather than violence, I and you will make it our personal business to ensure that everyone that we know is registered to vote and actually exercises their God-given right to vote so that we can get the candidate an office that this country needs, not a candidate that may continue to perpetrate the violence that was perpetrated against them. Let us make that our business. Let us not glorify the violence that was done against another person, lest it become all too common and too easy to turn to violence. You and I can laugh about how someone had an attempted murder against them on yesterday. It becomes too easy for violence to be in our hearts. And then it's too easy to enact that same verbal violence against your spouse. It's too easy to take that same violence and enact it against your child or grandchild. It's too easy to take that same violence against the people in our lives. So that is our prayer this morning that you and I would be the men and women of God that we have been called to be to stand against violence of any kind against any person. And that we would take seriously the call on our lives to vote and to ensure that everyone that we are connected with will engage in that activity. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let us pray fervently. God, Teach us, teach us to pull ourselves away from violence. Teach us as a church, as a society, as a community, and as a world that violence is not a required result when we are trying to work our way towards resolution. 
God, I pray for the candidates who are in this presidential election and all candidates that are in upcoming elections, that we will be able to, with godly behavior and godly thoughts, engage in a tenacious race, compete vigorously, and then win or lose respectfully. God, please remind us of the violence of our history we might not repeat it on a national stage or even on a personal stage. Master, I pray the violence out of the mouths, minds, and hearts of your brothers and sisters of Providence. I pray the violence away from their treatment of their children and grandchildren. I pray violence out of how they speak to each other and the brothers and sisters and their family. We acknowledge, oh God, this is an evil that began in this country since its inception, we must work to eradicate that evil. Protect your people, O oh God. Protect them from being victims of said violence and from being perpetrators against and for violence. We thank you, God, that you taught us that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Lead us, O oh God, and we shall, we shall be led. For it is in the name of the one who dealt with violence to bring peace. For it is in the name of Jesus, I do pray. And all of God's children who love the Lord, we all said together, Amen. Brothers and sisters, you've heard the scripture read into your hearing. If you would please let us look at this thesis verse in the seventh verse of chapter four of Second Corinthians. It reads as follows: "But we have this treasure in clay jars." Underline those words: "We have this treasure in clay jars." Providence Missionary Baptist Church and all of her guests, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We want to preach to you briefly on the subject of, in case of emergency, break open clay jars. In case of emergency, break open clay jars. Friends, we've all seen the signs. In case of emergency, break open glass. It's on a red case. And generally, on the inside of that case is a fire extinguisher or a fire alarm. When in danger, break the glass and help is on the other side. But what do you do when you're not in danger? But rather than being in danger, you're on your way to danger. Show me a person who doesn't pray consistently. And they may not be in danger, but I promise you they're on their way to danger. Show me a couple that doesn't read the Bible together, and they may not be in danger, but soon and very soon, they are on their way to danger. Show me someone who truly believes that they are the master of their fate and the captain of their own soul, and I'll show you someone who may not be in danger, but they are on their way. I've come this morning, Providence, to tell you that there's a text in Holy Scripture that is intended to keep you out of danger. And, and the same way that fire department put that fire extinguisher behind glass in a building, hoping that you never needed it, but instructing you to break the glass and get to it if you need to. This is the same way I am telling you, I pray your life never puts you in danger. I pray that you never lose a loved one. I pray that you never get diagnosed with an illness. I pray that you never lose a job. I pray that you are never a victim of identity theft. I pray that you never have family drama or go through a divorce. I pray that you never root for the Falcons. Because I don't want you to be in danger. I pray that life will always keep you away from these dangerous circumstances. But if you ever find yourself on the way 
to a dangerous circumstance. You should know the Bible says there's a treasure stored up for you in clay jars. L let me see if I can't explain what this means. By the time we get to the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is going through. He is stressed out, and he wrote about his stress in chapter 1 of the book. He wrote that he was pressed out of measure, and he despaired even his life. His seeming depression and frustration is all the more surprising given how successful and prolific his ministry actually was. I mean, we're talking about a man who wrote 13 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. We're talking about someone who planted an innumerable number of churches in Antioch and in Philippi and in Thessalonica and in Berea and in Corinth and in Ephesus and in Galatia. We're talking about someone whose theological contributions to a grace-based gospel are so profound that literally in the church, we quote Paul more than we quote Jesus. With all this going on from the outside, a person would say, Paul, you've been so prolific in your ministry. Paul, you've accomplished so much. Why are you stressed? And that's when real honest people can connect with the apostle Paul. Because honest people are willing to acknowledge, just because I look good on the outside doesn't mean I'm not stressed on the inside. Just because I function at a high level on the outside doesn't mean I don't have things going on on the outside. Just because you can't see who my demons are, just because you don't know what my struggles are, just because you've never walked a mile in my shoes, baby, don't you think I don't go through it sometimes. And the real people in the house know that I don't come to church to act like I'm too blessed to be stressed. I come to church because the stress is not going to block my ability to be blessed. Paul's stress was surrounding these churches in Corinth that he had planted. He planted these churches, and the historical record written by Josephus tells us that he stayed there for a year and a half, and he ministered to the people in Corinth to get the churches off the ground. He got the church moving. He got the churches growing. They were growing and establishing ministry. They were receiving the gospel each and every day. And, and the Bible tells us that he birthed the ministry, he nursed the ministry, he loved the ministry, and he gave everything he had to get these Corinthians churches going. The problem didn't show up while he was there. The problem happened when, after a year and a half, he left. The Bible says that when he left town, some false teachers came into town. They, they perverted the gospel. They taught something different than Paul taught when he established the churches. They tried to shame Paul in the eyes of the new converts that he had just planted. He sent his associate Timothy back to the churches. He wrote a letter, which you and I know as 1 Corinthians, that he hoped Timothy would bring to help put things back in order. But if you read the end of 1 Corinthians, you realize things didn't get better. They got worse. We've all been there. When you've done everything you think God has called you to do to correct a situation, to make a situation that God ordained you to be in get better and go the right way, and all you did was turn your head for two seconds and that situation didn't get better, it got worse. History tells us that he went back once and he wrote a different letter, a letter that if you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians closely, you know that there's a third letter to the Corinthians that our Bible does not include and we've never seen or never read. But we know that Paul went back to Corinthians to make things happen and he wrote a second letter that we don't have. And he did everything he could to pray them out of trouble. It was only after some time that his associate Titus reported back to him that things were finally corrected. He had gotten things where they needed to be. And in his excitement to hear that things had been corrected, he writes what you and I know as 2 Corinthians. Reread this first chapter of 2 Corinthians when you have time, and you'll read a writing of praise and joy to God that a problem has been resolved. You'll read about someone who is acknowledging that they take no credit for themselves of getting to the resolution, but they give God all glory and honor in their praise report that a problem that once existed has been corrected. A problem that was taking me down has been fixed. God, I asked you to show up, and you did just that. 
he writes in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, which you and I know is one of the most powerful doxologies written in the Bible. And whenever you have a chance, you should go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You should read it. You should write it down. You should read it again. You should learn it. You should pray it. You should sing it. Because these are the words to remind you that no matter how difficult the circumstance you are going through, that if my God could fix it back then for Apostle Paul, my God can fix it for you. These are the words that Paul writes. If you were to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the same consolation which we ourselves were consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also is the consolation abundant for us through Christ. If you are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and your salvation. If you are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you shall experience whenever you patiently endure the same sufferings that we are also suffering. Our hope for you, he says, verse 7, is unshaken. For we know that you share in our sufferings, but the good news is that you also share in our consolation. I have no expectation that you got it the first time I read it, but I do have an expectation that if you go home and read it again and again and again, eventually it'll hit your shando and you'll realize just how powerful a doxology that it is for your life. By the time we get to chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians, he's giving us the meat of his message. He begins, but we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. People always miss this verse, so let me help you. What he's saying is the shout moment of your Christian life is not the clay jars. It's the treasure in the clay jars that has the extraordinary power. We here in Corinth didn't overcome what we've been through because of the people. We overcame what we've been through because of the gospel that was on the inside of the people. It's not the people because the people actually get us into the mess. It's the heart that the Spirit puts on the inside of the people that transforms us and changes us in this life. Let me see if I can park the car right here and work this verse for a second. Can some of us just confess that in this lifetime, you've been too busy looking at the jar and you forget to check the treasure that's in the jar? Only to find out later that the jar didn't have the treasure, it only had trash, so you had to get rid of the jar. Y'all don't like that metaphor? Let me see if I can't come to your front doorstep. Have you ever dated someone that was a beautiful clay jar on the outside, only to fall they had a trash deposition on the inside and you had to get rid of that clay jar? Have you ever taken a job because they had a beautiful salary on the jar on the outside, only to get there and feel that the people and the culture was so toxic that you had to get out of there because you didn't check what was going on on the inside? Have you ever bought a beautiful clay jar of a car on the outside, but you didn't look under the hood to realize it had a trash transmission and a trash suspension, so you spent more time at the mechanic than you actually spent on the car? Paul said, we didn't get the, we didn't get the power from the jar. We get the power from the treasure that is in the clay jar. God never intended for you and I to get caught up on the beauty of the jar on the outside. God always wanted you and I to focus on the power of the treasure that was on the inside. This is why Paul says, I'm in verse 7, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. I should see some treasure on the inside of somebody and that power that belongs to God and does not come from us. Let me help you write this down. I promise I'm not going to stay here long. The next time you decide to date somebody before you marry them, you might focus less on what they look like on the outside and focus more on the treasure that you see on the inside. And if you don't see no Jesus, then you might want to walk on by. And I know what some of you online are thinking, well, Reverend Williams, I don't know how to assess the Jesus in somebody. Bring that Negro to my office. Doesn't take me long to figure out if there's a little Jesus on the inside or not. You got a little Jesus, we can boost that signal and we got something to work with. But if the car is parked and the keys are not in the ignition, why do you expect it to ride? You'll get that one later. Here's what you and I were supposed to catch from the text. You and I were supposed to figure out that clay jars are frail. 
Clay jars, if you've ever had one, are imperfect in the, in the way that they are made. In antiquity, at the writing of 2 Corinthians, clay jars were common, they were inexpensive, and they were easily broken. Paul is teaching us that you cannot invest in the clay jar itself because in actuality, the jar isn't worth very much. I pray you see where I'm going with this. Too often in this life, we invest in the clay jar itself rather than the treasure that is housed within the clay jar. The question isn't, is she fine? The question is, what is her spirit like? The question isn't, is he handsome? The question is, what is his faith like? I know the job pays well, but is the mission aligned with your spirit? I know the car is shiny, but is it durable to go where you need to go? I know they seem like a good friend, but you should invest in the purpose, not in the friendship. Is the clay jar something that God intends you to be with? Not for what it looks like on the outside, but for what God is doing on the inside. It's the treasure within the clay jar that should put a smile on your face. It's a treasure within the clay jar that you ought to connect with. It's the treasure within the clay jar that you should invest in. Metaphorically speaking from the Bible, you should know that the clay jars represent the human being. But the treasure represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why I want you reading the Bible is because I want you to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I know the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't take me long to talk to you to figure out if you have it on the inside of you. And if you don't have it on the inside of you, I think that you can still be a wonderful person, but I'm not so sure of how close you and I are to get because the plane I'm operating on and the foolishness you're dealing on are not the same. Here, brothers and sisters, when you have the gospel of Jesus Christ on the inside of you, you have what is called the knowledge of God's glory. You have the transformative power of God's salvation. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And the Bible says this is the treasure that is in the clay jar. The clay jar might not be worth much. The clay jar may not last long. The clay jar may break down. The clay jar is imperfect in every way. But if you get to what's on the inside of that jar, now you've got something. And the verse says, it's in there. It's in there so it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God. Here it is. The reason why you want to tap into the clay jar on the inside of the people that you deal with is because if you can reach for the gospel that's on the inside of someone else, then the gospel will reach back to you. And you will realize that you're not in my life because I picked you to be in my life. You're not in my life because I thought you were so attractive. You're not in my life because I wanted your friendship. You're not in my life because I wanted to build this network. You're in my life because the Jesus in you connected to the Jesus in me. And God intended for us to be together. So here it is. Stay with me. If the power belongs to God and comes from the treasure that's in the clay jar, that means the jar never blessed you. The jar itself is cheap and imperfect and breaks down easily. It's always the treasure in the jar that blessed you and not the person. Here it is. Some of us are in love with people who we are giving credit to that we should have given to God. There are some people who are getting some accolades from you that should have given to God. There's some people that you are honoring for who they are and you should give it to God. I've told you every day that I've been the pastor here and the day I stop, you should fire me. I ain't never blessed you a day in my life. It has always been God who gave the gospel. It always been God who preached the sermons. It's always been God who taught the Bible study. And every minute you see me, you better look behind me and see this cross because I didn't die to save your soul, but there's a man up there looking down on you who who gave everything he had that you might be. It was the treasure. It was the power of the gospel that God put in the jar that you should get excited about. It's the power of the gospel that God put in the jar that you ought to shout about. It's the power of the gospel that God put in the jar that you ought to connect to. In other words, if you have any appreciation for the clay jars in your life, if you have any appreciation for your spouse or your children or your friends or your family or your neighbors, if you have any appreciation for the things that they have done in your life, then you ought to look past them and tell God thank you. 
because that person didn't bless you. It was the power of the gospel that God put in them. And this is why Paul said, when you get around the right people who've got the right Jesus on the inside of them, read verse 8. He said, we are afflicted, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Here it is. If you've ever been in a fight with people who can fight, you are afflicted, but you are not crushed. You are perplexed, but you are not driven to despair. You are persecuted, but you are not forsaken. You are struck down, but you are not destroyed. But if you've ever been in with a fight with people who can't fight, you ain't nothing but afflicted and perplexed and persecuted and struck down. What am I trying to tell you? Some of the people you connected with don't have no Holy Ghost to fight the devil with. And therefore, you are afflicted and perplexed and persecuted and struck down. I'd rather be someone who knows how to throw these spiritual hands, and therefore, I'm still going to be afflicted but you can't crush me. I'm still going to be perplexed, but I'm not driven to despair. When you think of all the clay jars in your life and the accumulated power of the gospel that should be within you, the truth of the matter is with the number of people that you know who should be praying with you and praying for you, who should be studying the Bible with you and studying the Bible over you, who should be fasting for you and fasting with you. With the number of people in your life, I'm talking your friends, I'm talking your family, I'm talking your neighbors, I'm talking your church members. If these people actually have the spirit of the living God on the inside of them, then the truth of the matter is you should be ready to dance with the devil any day of the week. It doesn't matter what the devil throws in my life. I got such a great cloud of witnesses around me. I got such great clay jars in my life that I cannot be destroyed. I cannot be defeated. I cannot be devastated. I cannot be demolished. I can't be degraded or depressed or depleted or deflated. I can't be derailed or deactivated or debilitated. Devil, you can't do nothing with me because of who God has placed for me. Because I have this treasure in clay jars. Every now and then, I can't depend on my own mind. I can't depend on my own thoughts. I can't depend on my past experiences. Every now and then, in the crisis situation, in the emergencies of my life, I need to break open the clay jars in my life. Every now and then when the fire gets turned up on me and the problems start to come down on me, I need to get to the gospel that is in the clay jars that is in my life. The gospel that my ancestors believed in, the gospel that saved my life, the gospel that has kept me all the days of my life, the gospel that gives me access to the glory of Jesus, to the transformative and redemptive power of Jesus, the gospel that gives me hope and shall change my life, the gospel that is eternal and powerful and liberating and loving and salvific and inclusive and peaceful and reconciling and truthful and powerful in my life, only because I have access what God has given to me. So the next time the trouble comes in your life, brothers and sisters, I don't need you to go to social media. And I don't need you to call people that can't help you. I need you to break open the clay jars in your life that you know have some gospel because God will see you through. In case of emergency, break open clay jars. God bless you, Providence.